Hi folks, so this is the second video on coastal landforms and this time we're going to be talking about landforms created by deposition. The last video was landforms created by erosion and just a very quick reminder that what you're meant to be doing is to create yourself revision notes on all of these. Format is up to you, page 29 is the most important page, it's got the instructions any questions obviously give me a shout on email and I'll attempt to help you. Um, so we start with beaches um, in our bullet pointed list and if you've done uh, very much on rivers before um, you may have heard of floodplains which is the flat land surrounding river that's created by uh, repeated flooding. People kind of forget that floodplains are landforms because I guess they're not the most exciting landform and also they're sort of almost too common. We have that issue with beaches on coasts as well. Beaches are landforms, they are created by coastal processes. Just because we sort of maybe take them for granted a little bit doesn't mean that they're not landforms. So that's the first thing. And they're depositional features because of course you're only going to get a build up of sediment if that sediment is deposited. Now, the thing at A-level is we need to talk about features that you find on beaches. Okay, break point bars or break, uh, they have different names, point bars, um, I've heard various things. We've sort of talked about these before because these are created by just destructive waves which in the UK we generally get in the winter. So in the winter we tend to get more storms. Storms create destructive waves. Destructive waves have powerful backwash, so they take material off a beach. Where does all that material go? Ha ha! Well, ladies and gents, it creates a breakpoint bar. So the powerful backwash takes the material off the beach and it tends to deposit it in the near shore zone in a uh, ridge that we call a breakpoint bar. Um, then, because we uh, dealing with a system and we have feedback in the summer you will then get constructive waves that push with their powerful swash all of that sediment back up to the beach again so you will see a seasonal difference in the size of your beach now that sediment doesn't completely disappear it just goes um, off not offshore sorry to the near shore zone and it gets piled up into this landform. So you're unlikely to ever see these, but they're there. Ridges and runnels, uh, people find these really complicated and, and you don't need to. Ridges and runnels are generally found on sandy beaches and you may have seen them before. If you're walking across a sandy beach, there are often kind of puddles, if you like, in the sand. Um, well, they are ridges and runnels. So the, the ridge is the, the bit uh, where you can actually see the people. It's slightly higher and the runnel is where you can see the water. And they are simply drainage channels. So as the tide goes out, uh, the water is trying to drain back to the sea. Uh, yeah, to the sea because of gravity. And these runnels are the ways that the tide comes in and out. That's it. All right, so they're not particularly exciting things. Cusps. Now, these are a bit weird. Cusps are these very odd semicircular shaped features that you might have noticed on beaches. Uh, we do see them in, in the southwest quite a lot. Now, you don't need to get too stressy about cusps because these are very poorly understood. We know that they clearly have something to do with swash and backwash and different size sediment, but we don't really know exactly how they're created. So I do not want you to get too bogged down in that. I want you to be able to recognize them, and luckily they're fairly kind of um, easy to spot. And I've included a little YouTube uh, clip so you can see waves coming in and out and it's definitely something to do with the relationship between sediment, swash and backwash. But beyond that, please don't stress too much. Berms, now these are really important. These are crucial. So I'm hoping you can notice a ridge of sediment kind of there and probably one there. 
and probably one there. So you kind of have to get your eye in, but you can see different ridges of sediment. They are called berms and they are created by tides. You might be sat there thinking, well, hang on a minute, there's high tide and there's low tide, but why do you get more than, you know, why do you get so many berms? Can I just remind you that because we get um, a tidal cycle, so at spring tide, you've got the sun and the moon working together and you get your highest high tide, spring tide. So that's probably your spring tide berm. And then that is probably somewhere in between. And that might be your neap tide berm. So because you get the sun and the moon uh, working together in a slightly different way, depending on where we are in the month, it is possible to get multiple berms. But they are depositional features on beaches created by tides and I should just say you these days unfortunately you can often spot them because there will be a line of rubbish um, as well along the high tide line oh sorry and then lastly storm beach so storm beaches are kind of quite sensibly named really they are only affected by the sea in a storm Okay, so they're right at the back of the beach. The only time that your waves are going to be big and powerful enough to reach the back of the beach is during a storm, which is why storm beaches have their name. Generally, the sediment is much larger because during a storm, the waves have much more energy and the sizes of sediment that they're able to move around are much bigger. Uh, you will often find debris on storm beaches, as you can clearly see in this photograph, because again, uh, that's when the sea is going to be destroying all sorts of things and, uh, and you might find it on a storm beach as well. So they're right at the back of the beach and they're only affected by waves during storm conditions. So beaches, yes, they are landforms in themselves, but can we remember that they also have landforms on them as well? And that's important to know. Now, the next three and I'm going to add cusphate forelands actually to this list. Um, so you are going to need to write that onto page 29 because it doesn't say it at the moment. The next four landforms are all created by longshore drift. Okay, so you can actually learn these all together. I'm going to emphasize to you the differences between them, all right, because they're all formed by longshore drift. So spits are probably the most famous and spits are created across the mouths of rivers or what I'm going to hope you're going to begin to call estuaries. So what happens, this is the spit at Dawlish Warren, the River X. So this is the River X coming out to the sea. This is Dawlish Warren. This is Exmouth here. Okay, so in the southwest, the prevailing wind is from the southwest. So we've got the wind coming in that sort of direction, which means, of course, that the swash is always in that direction and the backwash is at 90 degrees. So at Dawlish, the longshore drift is going that way because the zigzags are going. Okay, don't know why I needed that sound effect. Never mind. The longshore drift is going that way. Now, the longshore drift cannot cut off the River X completely. The River X is too big, too powerful. The flow of that river is always going to keep a channel open. So spits go nearly all the way across the mouth of the river, but they do not go all the way across because the river is too powerful and it will uh, wash that deposition away. Okay, they have this very distinctive hooked end and we'll talk a lot more about spits um, in, in some videos coming up um, because they have other features like sand dunes and salt marshes and stuff that we're quite interested in. Bars, basically folks, go all the way across. There is no big powerful river here, so there is nothing to wash the deposited sediment away. So your longshore drift can just keep going and it joins one headland to the next headland completely and then you get what's called a lagoon behind it. All right, so, oh, sorry, wrong way. So the only difference here, spits do not go all the way across because you've got a big, fat, powerful river that will stop that from happening. 
bars go all the way across. And this is a really famous example in South Devon called Slapton Lay. So you can actually go and visit um, a, a bar if you would like to. And I don't mean the sort serving alcohol. Well, they're all shut anyway at the moment, so it <laughs> doesn't matter. Tombolos, cool name. Longshore Drift is coming along and it ends up joining an island to the mainland. So this island used to be separated from the mainland by the water and now the Longshore Drift has come along and it's basically joined it together with a beach. And here's a very pretty example. All right, so that's a Tombolo. And then Cuspate Foreland, I don't know why I forgot to put it on page 29, I can only apologise. Uh, the best description for them, which is a bit weird, is a triangular beach, right? So you've got the Longshore Drift coming from this way and Longshore Drift coming from this way, which is to do with local kind of weather patterns and local uh, currents, etc. And the Longshore Drift meets in both directions and deposits this rather strange feature uh, that has a, generally a triangular shape, and that's called a cuspate foreland. All right, so all four of those are created by longshore drift, but they are different. So it's important to learn about the differences between them, so you can emphasize that. And finally, uh, quite a complicated one called a barrier island. Now I've actually included um, some information on page 30 because these tend to confuse people the most. Right, Barrier Island. They're islands, that's where that part of the name comes from, so that's luckily quite straightforward. And they become barriers between the land and the sea. So this is very famous, this is Cancun in Mexico. Mexico is here. This is a barrier island. It is between Mexico and the sea. All right, now that is an entirely natural feature. The hotels and swimming pools clearly aren't, but the barrier island is entirely natural. We don't have any in the UK because our waves and tides and currents are too powerful and they would have um, eroded them all away. You get quite a few around uh, North and South America. So there's quite a few. Um, have a look at Florida and Mexico for lots of examples. Now, their formation is a bit strange. And I want to show you this animation. So at the end of the last ice age, when all of the ice melted, it washed shed loads of sediment into the sea. All right, so all of that is the sediment that gets washed into the sea by the melting ice. Now, what comes very soon after that, and I'll press play in just a second, is the water then starts to fill up the sea. Okay, so we've had loads of sediment washed in, and now the sea levels are rising. And can you see that what that water is doing is it's piling the sediment up. As the sea level rises, it's piling that sediment. And that is a barrier island. You've got a little bit of water between the land and the sea, kind of like a lagoon, but that is the barrier island being formed there. All right, so it's, it's a bit strange and you might want to watch that YouTube video a few times, but at the end of the last ice age, loads of sediment gets dumped into the sea. Then the sea levels rise, they push that de deposited sediment back towards the land and kind of pile it up. And that's where you get these barrier islands from. They are very vulnerable. As sea level rise kicks in with climate change, they will be lost gradually. Um, they are incredibly vulnerable things, but they're pretty cool. All right, so um, you've got a version of this on page 30 of your module because often people find them quite confusing. So that's it from me in terms of explanation and it's, in, it's basically handing over to you to get on with your revision notes um, so that you could recognise and explain the formation of all of those coastal landforms. Alright, that's quite a big task but it's a really important one.